Lena, can I? May I ask you to stay up here? And may I invite the uh, uh, our previous speakers, Mayor Ilmar Ripalu, who's going to do a high jump up here. Uh, Prof. Peter Newman, Mr. Edgar Chua, Mr. Liak. We have about 15 minutes for a question and answer. So far, there's been a couple of questions on the pigeonhole, but um, we'll, we'll be more than happy to take questions from the audience. So, uh, if, if if you've got a question, please make your way to a microphone. Uh, the the Looks like we do have a question. Uh, Dario Hidalgo from Embark is a program sponsored by Shell Foundation. And, and really congratulate the whole panel because it has been an eye opener and really interesting approach and will be very helpful and probably work with some of you on, 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 on spreading out the the Singapore index, but mostly the Singapore experience. For the colleague in, in, in Shell, it's, it's interesting to see this business perspective, and this business perspective may mean that the cost of doing business is, is higher. And in a competitive environment, and competing with other global companies that are in the same field, how it is uh, special to have this approach and, and still keep the bottom line. Uh, thank you. Actually, we, we see this as an investment, and we see that this investment actually pays for itself, because uh, if, if you're seen as a good neighbor, if you're seen that uh, you're following all the uh, regulations and policies, and even more, uh, you know, just on project execution, the delays that can happen, significant, and uh, the cost per day of delay is, is huge. So. Uh, if only for that, uh, we believe that investing in biodiversity in sustainable development is well worth it. As I mentioned earlier, the other benefits are in the aspect of attracting uh, talent. Uh, all companies, we, we, have, uh, uh, we say that we have various assets in the companies. We can have a, a manufacturing facility, you can have a, a, a network of uh, retailers. But at the end of the day, it's really about the people you attract in the company, the people that you retain. And, and we, we have seen how important this is, especially to the young people now, that uh, a company is seen as a responsible company. And so we're able to attract very, very good talent. Uh, it helps in the reputation. People would like to be associated with a good company. So um, we, we really see that uh, it's an investment which uh, gives a very good return. Thank you. Uh, let's go with one of the pigeonhole questions, which, and then we'll, we'll take a question from the, the audience. The, the question is, basically, can you put a price um, to ecosystem services and biodiversity that makes it competitive, or, or is it something that has to be a public policy um, issue? Um, Mir? Uh, first of all, uh, today we are just uh, normally measuring the GDP. And with the GDP, we, we believe that we are measuring uh, success or a better world and everybody knows that GDP is not enough. GDP just measures how much resources we are using and GDP don't take any account of natural services, natural capital. Uh, today we don't have any way to, to measure that. We know that we have for instance problems with the fishery when we are overfishing areas. We can see that uh, we are taking out so much fishes so they can't, can't uh, come back. And then we can, of course, calculate what will happen uh, with the people that are, that are reliant on having that fishes. For instance, in uh, West Africa, where, where the big ships from Portugal and, and uh, other parts of Europe are taking away almost all the fishes there. There we have today negotiations on how to handle that, of course. That's, of course, you could put money on it, but you haven't reached that level today. Uh, I, 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 we haven't told you about uh, how we bridge, made a bridge between Malmö and Copenhagen, and we made a wind uh, generator park offshore. When we built that bridge, we were very much anxious what will happen in the marine bi biotope while we are building that bridge. Are we going to destroy the marine biotope by putting that bridge down there? So we calculated what's happened with the marine life. And what we noticed is that uh, that enhanced and it's much better than it ever been before. 
uh, lots of new muscles are growing on the bridge where we put the wind park. That was a shallow water where lots of fishermen like to take the, put the nets out and take the fish. Now they can't do that anymore. And that's an excellent breeding park for cods today. So that's the best way to see that, that you can, can enhance uh, the fishes for breeding when you are doing like that. That is done without purpose. But if you do it with a purpose, of course, you can do much more and much better. So I think we are just in the starting point where we are trying to calculate the, the value of the natural capital and how much you can take out from these eco-services and what the value of them is. I'll just add a quick thing. The, the question asks, is, it, uh, is there a benefit cost ratio that you can do that shows that nature actually would be better left there rather than building a city. And I think that's a false dichotomy because you won't actually be able to show a benefit cost ratio that says leave it alone. But if you do a city design that incorporates this biophilics into it, then you can have a better benefit cost ratio and it includes nature in a new way. The difference is either you have an anti-urban approach or a pro-urban approach. If it's anti-urban, I don't think we're going to win on biodiversity because the cities are going to keep growing. They are providing the opportunities that people are flocking to around the world. And we have tended to think, oh, it's going to ruin nature. Well, maybe if we keep doing it the way we have been, but now we have an opportunity with these new technologies and new approaches to actually incorporate nature in the city itself and increase biodiversity. There are opportunities of making the city a regenerative force for nature. That's the new thing that's happening now. Uh, just two quick points here. One, there are, we, we have not measured ecosystem services because we're just not aware of it. Like, for example, if you're in a hospital and you uh, are put on the oxygen tank, you pay a lot of money for that oxygen. But we breathe in and out oxygen all this time and we take for granted. It's the trees that actually uh, provide the oxygen and we don't pay a single cent for it. So these are the ecosystem services that we have just discounted because it's not put into the monetary system, our economic system. The other thing is, uh, the second point is um, that there is actually a big project called TEEB, the Economics of Ecosystems um, and Biodiversity, Services and Biodiversity, and that actually tries to uh, address some of these uh, externalities and things that we have um, not included into our uh, um, you know, GDP and yeah, our economic system, yeah, thanks. I think um, Mayor Ripalu had something to add to this too. Oh yes, we are, we, even if we don't pay for the ecosystem services like that, we still do it on the other way. We have the polluters pay principle. So you can start with that and say, how much are the polluters paying? Is that the, the, the damage they are doing to the nature that we can start with cal calculating from that way. And I should like to ask the, the representative from Shell, for instance, when you're using the tar sand, for instance, with all this steam and like that, how are you calculating the polluters' pay, pr pay principle in that way? Um, we can take, I think there was a question. Yes, we can take one from the audience. Um, I'm Kelvin. I'm asking a question from the point of view of an architect and also a community uh, participant in gardening. I noticed uh, there's a few patterns. One is that we try to integrate nature into the city and new buildings. From a very infrastructure point of view, we design to make sure there's public space, biodiversity and greenery on buildings. That's one way we've seen it done. The other way is to have some ownership and hospital there. We have community participating in making farms and gardens, etc., because it gives us a sense of ownership. That's very important too. And of course, there's a benefit of the of the, of the inhabitant, uh, be it a patient hospital, looking at greenery and, and feeling better, or this potential for a minimum consumption of nature on an everyday basis. But I, I sense the sense that um, there's a very much of a top-down approach where it's either provided by the state or the designer, or that is a very 
passive, I'm a consumer of nature approach. So given that cities are going to continue being high density and possibly high rise, how should we bridge the gap that we would really allow for the individual as a, as a garden or as a household to participate in creating this greenery instead of just being very passive and enjoying it? Is there, would there be a difference in outcome or in the sustainability of, the, of this approach? Thank you. Um, let me just add something, and, and I think uh, our hospital CEO may be able to add, but the, I think it is a different approach to public policy in general that you're raising, and every time it is done, it is a better result. I've never seen one where it doesn't actually work. This deliberative process that engages the community early on and enables them to have a say at every stage of the development. I am totally convinced that that works and can work in this case. We, we are developing a biophilic process in Australia and it is very much a bottom-up approach at the moment. We've got a lot of community gardeners who are keen to be part of it, but we've also got a lot of small businesses creating new ways of doing it in an Australian kind of way. We've got milk crates that are being piled together with plants in them and you can just build up a, a wall out of, no, out of nothing and just put it there and it'll work. Now this came from a young guy who was a gardener who said, I, I think I can do this at very much less cost than, than the top-down way you're suggesting. And I think that, that we'll get more and more of that. And that's a good sign, I think, of, of a, a really important development when you've got grassroots ideas coming up and uh, together with top-down things and they meeting in the middle in a way that is very creative. I love it. Um, b before uh, M Mayor Rupalu takes the mic, I just want to thank Wendy Yap and Muslim Anshari from National Parks, along with uh, Xi Ji Ji Chiang and Danet Zhuang from the Urban Redevelopment Authority, made this whole symposium possible. Um, the last question, basically, I mean, uh, segueing into this one is can. Singapore be replicable? I mean, is it, rep and, and same with Malmo or with the Kutekwat Hospital, can we replicate this elsewhere? Um, real quick, we have three minutes left, but we can do it. Everyone? Yeah, sure, everyone, everyone. Uh, yes, I think it's uh, replicable because the, the thing is that um, our community in Bloom groups, I mean, they are uh, coming up, the people are asking even for vertical greenery. There, there, there's requests for it. Um, where I live, the neighbourhood park, it's the residents who actually come and do the gardening. It's not uh, end park staff doing it or pushing it. They they just go and do it. The you know everyone is just very enthusiastic about it. So I I think um, it's it's not a top down. I think people are beginning to see that it's really. This is what we want, and this is what we want to do. And I think end parts. We quite often have surveys asking people what they want to. So, you know, um, so I think that's important. Maybe I address the earlier questions about top down, bottom up. I think it takes two hands to clap. I think whoever that is a landowner, let's say the authority, need to have some degree of self confidence that they won't lose control. That they also need to be the type of people who are not afraid that things will go wrong. All right, but if they are afraid, uh, then they won't let anything uh, happen. Right? On the other hand, for the bottoms up, the people need to have a passion. Two, if you have passion, you also need to be competent. Because there are people who are passionate, but they are not competent. They, they, they don't have a good idea of how to do things. Then it wouldn't work. So I think when you have both sides that happen, of course it's replicable. I mean, things like that happen all over the world. They are, if you look around, there are good projects going on in Singapore too. There are many, many very good things that is happening, except that sometimes you don't know about it. Yeah? It's replicable. I think it's a matter of uh, mindset and uh, political will in most cases. There are pockets all over the world, uh, but having it uh, rolled out in the same way as Singapore means really having political will and mindset. Thank you. I believe that... Uh, this uh, urban farming, that is, uh, of course, very nice. And some places, maybe you can even get food enough. Habana, for instance, has worked very much with the urban farming, and they get quite a lot out of it. In my city, we get uh, only one harvest a year. 
so I think we should have some problems if we try to, to, to survive in that way. From our point of view, it's very important to see in what way the city is growing. What, what sort of, of land are you taking to, to build the houses on and what land do you preserve so that you have city close farming? In that way you enhance so you can have the food quite close to you and not have that, that uh, uh, carbon dioxide footprint to be too big. Um, and uh, then of course the greening and working like that, that's very good for the human being. We use it for instance for people that have chronic st stress syndromes. So you rehabilitate people with working like that with farming cities. Prof, last word. The um, writer Jane Jacobs says that uh, the history of cities is about innovation that gets copied from one group to the next and then improved and then someone else copies that and it goes around the world very quickly from city to city. This is what this conference is all about and it is really what sustainability is about at the point where innovations are happening and we hear about them and we go back and we try them out in our own city and then we share that experience and we probably do better than Malmo and Singapore because we've got a, an in innovation that we're learning from. And that's the, uh, that's the way of the world, that's the way sustainability is spreading. And uh, I, I write books about these sort of things and they get out of date very quickly because people are doing it so quickly these days. The innovation is extraordinary. And uh, that's why we're moving to make films, because the word can get out there quicker. Thank you. Fantastic. Please join me in thanking our wonderful array of speakers. I'd like to thank all of you for, for attending and, and taking part in this, uh, this dialogue. And uh, I hope that you've enjoyed the session as much as I have.